Let's kind of go back and, and, and look at verse at chapter 3. Let me read down through there while you're looking for it. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that, that we are appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and you know. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. <clears throat> but now, when Timotheus came from you unto us, and brought, and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, and we, as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our afflictions and distress by your faith. For now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God, night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. So Paul, <coughs> again, if we remember, Satan, Satan messed it up where he couldn't go back to Thessalonica. And so after a time there, he was in Athens. Uh, he sent Timothy, or Timotheus as he called him there, back to Thessalonica to find out how they were doing and to get a report and to bring back. And, of course, when he comes back, he gives them a report that not only are they okay, but they're thriving. They're still going through persecution. They're going through trials just like he told them they would. You know, if the child of God is going to serve God, you're going to face <laughs> tribulation. The Bible tells us that. Uh, and, yeah, and all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The Bible tells us. So they were not going through something that was, was uh, uncommon. But, uh, but Paul is excited to hear that they're doing so well. And we find ourselves here in verse 11. And let's read our text this morning. The Bible says, Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, Lord, we come before your throne this morning. Lord, we come as your church. And Father, we, we, we kneel before you, we bow before you, and we ask, Lord, for the Holy Spirit of God to speak to hearts this morning. Lord God, as we speak the truth of the Word of God, we pray that the Holy Ghost would open up uh, understandings, illuminate the truth, Father, that we might all might be able to receive it. Father God, we just pray, Lord, that the light of truth shine in the darkness of our lives and, Lord, produce the fruit, the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Lord, I pray, Lord, that, that Lord, you take our, our, our eyes this morning and turn them from the things of this world and turn them toward heaven, turn them toward home. Help us to realize we're in the last mile of the way, Lord. We're, we're coming close to home going. And Father, help us to be prepared, ready in heart and mind. Father, I'm so thankful that I'm your child. I'm thankful, Lord, that this world is not the end. Lord, this is only the runway for heaven. Father, I'm so grateful. Help us, Lord, uh, to, to realize some important truths this morning. Settle our soul about some things. Lord, please speak to us now. We'll give you all the glory and praise for it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. So, these last three verses of, of chapter 3, again, Paul, Paul is talking about, he said he wants the Lord to increase them and he wants them to abound in love. In verse 11 and 12, that's what the Bible is telling us. So Paul is praying again. Here he's asking the Lord. He said in verse 11, he said, Lord, he said, direct our way to them. I want to go see them so bad. He's talking about uh, the word direct there. He's talking about, Lord, get us, 
give us a straight course and without stops and detours, we want to get to them. Amen. He wanted he wanted the Lord to fix the road, restore the road that Satan had tore up and blocked to prevent his coming to the Thessalonians that was mentioned in chapter two and verse eighteen. He longed to see them, and uh, and it appears that God graciously granted him the, the answer to his prayer about five years later when Paul visited Macedonia to encourage the churches there in Acts chapter twenty verses one through three. The Bible gives us indication of that. The Bible said, And after the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto him the disciples and embraced them and departed for to go into Macedonia. And when he had gone over those parts and had given them much exhortation, he came into Greece and there abode there three months. And when the Jews had laid wait for him, he was about to sail into Syria. He proposed to return through Macedonia. All of that is over here in this same area where he went before. So it's more than likely he visited them uh, five years later after that. But, uh, but anyway, verse 12, if you look at it, I want you to notice it says, The Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another. Okay? This is one of 32 times in the New Testament where one another is mentioned, of loving one another. Uh, God re keeps that theme going all through the Word of God. The love that a Christian is to have for other Christians is one of the most important things in the New Testament. Our love, our fellowship, our communion with one another is so powerfully important to our success and so important to... Uh, uh, to what God wants us to be. We're to love one another. And we're to love one another with a, with a love. Our love is not to just be stagnant. The Bible uh, gives us the indication that God wants our love toward one another to be an increasing love. We're not to ever let that level off or cool. It's to, we're to, the longer we're a child of God, the further we go in this Christian life, the more we're to love the people of God. It's to grow, increase, and abound. This message is not going to be so, such a powerful, uh, bombastic message. It is a teaching message. I want, you to get, I want you to get your mind around these things that Paul is trying to uh, stress this morning. Um, again, it's important that, we're, that we love one another. It's especially important in times of affliction, times of trial. But why, and the reason for that is when you go through something, you go through a hard time in your life, you go through a trial, it's easy to take the focus off of others and serving others and put that focus on yourself. It's, it's, it's a danger for us to turn inward and forget about everybody else when we go through things. Uh, the, the, the great Bible teacher Warren Wiersbe, he said, times of suffering can be times of selfishness. Persecuted people often become very self-centered and demanding. What life does to us depends on what life finds in us. And nothing reveals the true inner man like the furnace of affliction. Some people build walls in times of trial and shut themselves off. Others build bridges and draw closer to the Lord and to His people. Even though this, this church at Thessalonica was going through a time of persecution and trial, Paul was telling them they're, they're to shun the temptation to become self-centered. They're, they're to increase in love for others rather than to decrease. He prayed for them to love one another more, and God answered their prayer, his prayer when he prayed for them to love one another more. In, in 2 Thessalonians 1, 3, the Bible says, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. So the very thing that he prayed for, guess what? God's a God that answers prayer. Amen? We ought to expect God to answer prayer. When we pray for somebody, we ought to expect that thing to take place. Amen? If we ask God to bless somebody, we ought to expect God to bless them. If we ask, pray God to heal somebody, we ought to expect God to heal them. Amen? We ought to pray believing for the things that we pray for. Amen? And Paul believed when he prayed for God to increase their love, and that's exactly what happened. And it's a sobering thing. For Paul to tell us to increase in love. 
Because one of the most dangerous things in the life of a Christian is to slack off, is to back up, is to take a rest. And, you know, I'm just doing so much for God, I just need to take a break. No, that's a dangerous thing. You know why it is? Because nobody sits still. I saw a cartoon a long time ago drawn by a, a, a Christian cartoonist. And it shows a guy in a, in a, I don't think I mentioned this one time, it shows a guy in a, in a canoe and, uh, and he's, he's taking a nap in it. And it says, in order to backslide, all you have to do is stop paddling. And it, it'll do it for you. Because we're headed upstream. We're not headed downstream. We're headed upstream. And all you got to do is stop paddling and you're going to go backwards. You only, you only, again, nobody sits still in, the, in, the, in, the, in their time with God. We're either moving forward or moving backwards. But it's dangerous for us to take a vacation. Normal Christian growth brings with it an increase in love to each other and all people. It's just normal. Amen? The, the, again, the closer you get to Christ, the more Christ's love is going to come through you. Amen? The more you know Him and, and, and understand Him and have the mind of Christ and have the heart of Christ, it, you can't help it's going to come out. It's got to flow through you. And, uh, and the Thessalonians, uh, the Thessalonians, they were a model church. I mean, they, they were fantastic, but there's still room for growth. None of us have arrived. None of us have achieved something. Amen? There's still room for improvement in their love. Now, don't, don't give up on me yet. I'm almost there. I mean, we're in the last verse. Amen? That was quick, wasn't it? We're going to park here a minute. Amen? All right, so the third thing, or the second thing we see here in verse 13, let's read it. It says, To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Focus on that three-word phrase there, unblameable in holiness. <coughs> now, I want you all to know, also to notice there in verse 13 that the Lord's coming is mentioned. Do you know it's mentioned in every chapter of the Thessalonian epistles? Every single chapter, Paul mentions the coming of the Lord. Chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians dealt with waiting for the Lord's return. In verse 10 it said, And to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. So it dealt with His return. Chapter 2 spoke of the presence of Christ at His coming. In verse 19 it said, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. And the last verse of chapter 3 here deals once again with the coming of the Lord. As Paul prayed for these Christians, he thought about not only their present holiness, he wanted them to live for God now, but also their need to go on to perfection and mature as believers. Nobody needs to just stay where they are. We don't need to get in a rut. We need to always be growing. None of us have arrived. And the best thing we can ever do is realize that none of us have arrived. Amen? Sister Nell, she, she's how old? 90? 94. 94? Wow. When did you have a birthday to sneak up on me? <laughs> well, amen. 94. But you know what? You may have lived 94 years, but guess what? Well, you ain't, you ain't reached perfection yet, have you, sister? Not yet. Now, I know you. I know you. I know you're a wonderful Christian lady, but you ain't reached. You haven't reached that level of perfection. None of us ever will, as long as we're down here in the flesh. But we are to keep growing. Amen. We're to, you're not to stop growing, sister, just because you hit 94. Amen. Keep growing. There's no there's no museum for Christians. We don't retire. Amen. We continue to grow. Continue to become what God wants us to be. And and so. Paul, Paul prayed that they might abound in love and in order to be blameless in holiness. I bet most of y'all have heard the name H.A. Ironside. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. But H.A. Ironside, he, he pastored the Moody Memorial Church in Chicago after Moody, after Moody passed away, I'm assuming. I'm not real sure, but he was, he was the next pastor. He was a lay pastor. He wasn't ever ordained, but... But he pastored there for 18 years, and he was a great teacher of the Scriptures. 
in the first half of the 20th century. But he struggled as a young man with the problem of holiness because Dr. Ironside had an earnest desire to experience complete sanctification. In other words, to be 100% separated unto God. You know, D.L. Moody made that statement. Probably why he felt that way is because D.L. Moody made that statement. He said, the world is yet to see what God can do with a fully consecrated man, a man that's 100% separated to God. So I'm sure if he heard that, I'm sure that weighed on him. But the story is told that where he thought he had to be completely holy or perfect in order to be saved. He was confused about that early on. And so he'd have some kind of experience. He'd pray a prayer and believe he was saved. And, and he'd think he, he thought he would get to the point where he thought he was completely sanctified. And he'd go for about a week or two. And then he would realize, hey, I'm not perfect after all. I messed up again. So, and then he would come to the conclusion that he wasn't saved after all. So he'd go back and do the thing all over again, pray and ask God to save him. And did it over and over and over and over. And finally... In the middle of his problem, he read Hebrews 12, 14, where it read, Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And he finally realized and understood that what one strives for, he ain't attained yet. If you're still striving, you haven't got there. But that it will be attained when he finally sees the Lord. And that same thought is what's here in 1 Thessalonians 3, 13, where Paul's mention holiness in connection with the Lord's coming. We, we're imperfect in this life, and we know that we are. We constantly fall short, and we have to come to God in confession of our sins. But the day is coming when we're going to be perfect. The day is coming when we'll be absolutely blameless. Not only in our position before God, but in our spiritual state. We won't ever sin again. We'll be absolutely perfect before God. The day will arrive when we stand before Christ at His coming. You know, i got flaws in my life. i got failures in mine. You've got them in yours. And we're right to be concerned about them. But if He saved us, He'll never let go of us. Amen? Not until He's brought us to perfection. And that won't be realized until He comes for His own. This was the main request behind Paul's prayer, that they might grow in grace and attain the ultimate goal of being blameless in holiness before Christ that is coming. That's what Paul wanted more than anything. And again, that's what I want for this church. I want, I want us to live lives for God that honors Him. Amen. And, and I look forward to the day when we stand together in holiness before the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 13 points out another expression. At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all His saints. Now, I think you all agree with me on this statement. The Lord could return for His church at any time. I mean, it's, it's imminent. We believe in the imminent, any moment return of Christ. That 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, I know we haven't got there yet, but we will, that all that's going to be fulfilled, which talks about the coming of Christ, that the dead in Christ are going to rise, that the living Christians are going to be raptured into heaven without dying into the presence of God. We believe that. Amen. He's coming for us. And also we believe that after this event, there's going to be a time, a great time of trouble in the world, predicted by Daniel, predicted by Jesus, culminating in the great tribulation. And that could happen, that could start, that could start any moment, as soon as we're gone. Amen. We believe at the end of that great tribulation, there will be the second coming of Christ, when he comes back to this earth in power and in glory from heaven with the saints of God and the holy angels, and then he's going to establish his righteous government on this earth just as the Bible predicted over and over and over. That kingdom is going to last for 1,000 years. You can read about that in Revelation 21. Well, we may read it. Uh, in Revelation 21 through 6. And ultimately, it will be followed by eternity after the judgment of the great white throne. Revelation 21 through 6. Let me read it. He said, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. 
and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. So during that thousand years of Christ's reign on earth, Satan will be bound and in the bottomless pit. And he said, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls that, of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, nor, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Amen. We're going to reign with Christ a thousand years. So there's a definite difference, hear me, a definite difference between his coming for his saints, which is the rapture, and his coming with his saints, which is the second coming, to establish his thousand year kingdom. There's a difference in those two things. Coming for and coming with. So where does, where does verse 13 fit into this? Let's read it again. To the end he may, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Okay. <clears throat> when will Christians be presented blameless in holiness before God? That's the question. If we believe that Christ is coming before the time of Jacob's trouble, the seven years of tribulation, then we will be presented blameless in holiness before God long before the second coming to set up his kingdom, at least seven years. Right? If he comes, listen, if, if the trumpet blows today and we're gone, okay, we're going to be with the Lord. Y'all realize that, right? Okay? We're going into the presence of the Father then. I think we're going to explain. I think you'll understand the scripture here in just a minute. So realize there in verse in verse 13, the key in this, to the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God. So we are going to stand unblameable in holiness before God at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Let's make that verse make sense. Let's look at it and make sense of it. All right. <clears throat> when will Christians be presented blameless, blameless in holiness before God? Again. It's got to be before the second coming. It's got to be before we come back with him. If that's true, how do we explain this verse? The word is coming. The word coming in there, that's, that is the, the key to, to understanding it. At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with his saints. All right. Now I'm going to get technical with you for just a second, but I want you to stay with me. Don't lose me. Don't get groggy and miss what I'm saying. There are at least three words in the New Testament that are used to express the truth about the coming of our Lord. There's epiphania, apocalypsis, and parousia, those three Greek words. Now, I'm not trying to get all fancy and try to look at how smart he is. No, I'm really dumb as a box of rocks, but I know a little bit. I can understand what I'm reading to you here this morning. <clears throat> all three of these words, epiphania, apocalypsis, and parousia, are used of Christ's coming for his church. All three of those words. They're also used in of his coming to set up his kingdom on the earth. So they're used for both. Okay? They're not technical words. They're just general, ordinary words. And all of them have to do with his coming. One of them, Epiphania, speaks of his appearing. Okay? That is that we're all going to see him. So he'll, boom, he'll appear. Epiphania. All right? You understand that one? All right? And then we're also told... We're also told in the Word of God that when Christ comes to set up his kingdom on the earth, that every eye will see him. Okay? So that's epiphania. Then the word apocalypsis is translated revelation. So the word used for the name of the last book of the New Testament, the revelation of Jesus Christ, in the sense that 
In that day, His glory will be revealed. Okay, Apocalypsis. His glory will be revealed. First time He came, He came in humiliation. He didn't come in glory the first time. His glory was hidden the first time, except on the Mount of Transfiguration and maybe in the Garden of Gethsemane. And in the Garden, what I mean by that is when they came to take Him and they asked if He was Jesus, and He said, I am He, and they all fell backwards. <coughs> I'm sorry, they all fell down. They all fell down. That's what they did. They fell down. They fell down because they were they knocked him. They, they were knocked down because it was a brief flash of his glory, and boom! It just knocked them to the ground. <coughs> but for the most part, his glory was veiled even after his resurrection. For the most part, people didn't see his glory. But when he comes a second time, everybody's going to see him in glory. Everybody's going to understand His glory. There'll be a revelation of His glory, an unveiling of His glory, and they will never see Him the way they saw Him the first time. They'll see Him as a conquering king from that moment on. But the word here in 1 Thessalonians 3.13 is neither, is neither the first two. No, it's perusia. And the word perusia means presence. But it's usually translated coming. It comes from two Greek words, and they go together to mean to be alongside of or to be present. Perusia, that word, doesn't strictly mean coming, and, it, and it's used with other meanings. I'll give you some examples. It means presence, and it's translated that way in two other passages. I'll give them to you. First, 2 Corinthians 10, 10, talking about Paul, for his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his spirit is, is speech contemptible. So they're just talking about his presence being there. <laughs> Philippians 2.12 Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. So it's again talking about his physical presence. So what does this word perusia mean in 1 Thessalonians? So when somebody's coming to see us, we talk about their presence, okay? I, I, let me let me kind of make this as clear as I can. If we have a visiting preacher coming, so if let's uh, we had Brother Leo Lyle here not too long ago. Let's just say he was coming back next Sunday. I'd say, you know, well, we're happy for the coming of Leo Lyle. We're happy for him to come next Sunday. We're looking forward to his coming. Now, what would we mean if we said that? We're not talking about how he got here. We're looking forward to Brother Leo driving his van up here. That's his coming, right? We're not talking about, oh, we can't wait till he drives those miles from, from, from down there and dive all up here to Clarksville. Man, what a, we can't wait for that trip. No, that's not what we're talking about at all. We're talking about his coming, his presence. Right? How he got here wouldn't be important. The point would be that he was here and that we're glad for his presence to be here. His coming was just a means to an end, you see. The trip was just a means of him getting here so he could speak. And that's the thought here. So when are we going to be in the presence of the Father? Well, according to Scripture, we're going to meet Christ in the air at the rapture. And we'll be present with Him at that very moment. And after we meet Christ in the air, He's going to take us home to be in the presence of the Father and the angels. So after that, we'll return back to earth with Christ at the end of those seven years. So the word coming here doesn't refer specifically to the coming of Christ with his saints to the earth, but the coming of us with him to heaven to be in the presence of the Father. That, that's the only thing that makes sense when you read the scripture. All right? All right, so he says, to establish our hearts unblameable in holiness before God. So we'll be at that moment changed in the moment of the twinkling of an eye and we'll have the mind of Christ and the body of Christ and we're taken by Christ coming into the presence of the Father. Y'all see that? Yeah. Amen. <clears throat> that's, that's, that's the same thought considered in 1 Thessalonians 2.19 for what is our hope, our joy, or crown of rejoicing are not even ye in the presence of, of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming. So in verse 313, the verse translated literally reads, Before God, even our Father, at His coming, at the coming presence of our Lord Jesus Christ with all His saints. All right? 
There's a coming to earth, but there's also a coming to heaven. And what an event that homecoming is going to be. Can you imagine? I, I, I sang uh, I got, uh, at that funeral on Wednesday. I sang, uh, I want to stroll over heaven with you some glad day. Sang that one and sang another one and said, uh, I am home, I am home. I can see King Jesus on his throne. There's my family and my loved ones that have gone home before. I am home, I am home. I'm going to tell you something. Singing them songs and, 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 and thinking about all that, that funeral over on Wednesday, just makes it so much real, so much more real. I mean, there's, you know, every year on the face of the trumpet, people start talking about, you know, the Lord can come back, he can come back during this, he can, literally, he can come back anytime. But people get stirred up more about it around this time of the year. By the way, if you hadn't, if you don't know, it's around the time of Jesus' real birthday. So if y'all want to, if y'all want to celebrate, now be the time to do so. Amen. Just thought I'd throw that in. But the thing is, listen, we're going home someday soon to be with Jesus. And when we get there, what a time it's going to be. Listen, we'll get to see everybody. Amen. Amen. Not just our family that we miss, that have gone on. We're going to get to visit with all the saints of all the Bible. We're going to get to stand and talk with Moses about what it was like to walk through that Red Sea. We're going to get to, we're going to, get to talk with David about what it was like to walk down that valley and face Goliath. We're going to get to talk talk to all the saints about all the things that took place, and I mean, and not only that, I believe we'll get to experience it and see it all somehow. I don't know for sure, but but I, I just kind of kind of feel like God let us see the video on it. Amen. At least I hope so, anyway. But what a day that's going to be when we get there. Listen, when all the dead in Christ, when all the living Christians are caught up together to be with the Lord, and we all get to heaven as the trophies of grace. Trophies of God's resurrecting power. And we're presented spotless. As the spotless, perfect bride of Christ. As a holy people. As the workmanship of Christ. What He built. What He, what he did. Amen. And we'll honor Him for what He did. Amen. For what He did for us and how He delivered us. And in the coming of Christ, with His saints, when He takes us out of this world to heaven, we will be blameless in holiness before our God, the Father. And it won't be because of how good a life you lived. It's not going to be because of anything you did. Understand that. There's nothing you'll be able to hold up and say, well, I did this great. Wasn't it? That? Listen, thank God I did this when I got into heaven. No, it ain't got nothing to do with you. It ain't got nothing to do with anything you did after you got saved. Everything you did after you got saved is just to honor your Savior. Amen? It's just to honor Him by allowing Him to work through you. To, to The love that is, that is manifested through you to the others that Paul talks about us abounding in and increasing in. That's not anything we generate. That's something God generates in us. It comes from us because we, 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 we submit ourselves to Him and yield ourselves to Him and stop trying to show Him how we can live the Christian life without His power. You've got to have Him. You need Him and more of Him. And the more of Him you have, the more of Him comes through. The more of Him comes through, the more people sense it and feel it and experience it. And the closer they're drawn to coming to Christ themselves. And when, we, when we're able to, to live a life like that, we have, so, we have something to get excited about going home to celebrate. Can I share something with you? I asked you last week, have you ever witnessed, I think it was last week, have you ever witnessed to one person and saw one person trust Christ? That's the point. That's the excitement about getting home. It's to see those we ushered in with us. That's the exciting part. Oh, if you ain't never, if you ain't never tried to lead anybody to Jesus, get busy. Get busy. Make it count. There's not much time left. And you want something to, you want, you want to get there, I promise you. You want to get there. It might just be one soul. But let me tell you something. When you get up there in that crowd of people, you want to find that one. Amen? I guarantee you want to find that one. Put your arm around them and stand before Jesus and say, Praise God, we're here. Amen? That ought to get you excited to think about. I don't know how big that crowd's going to be that stand with me. I don't know. I know there'll be some. 
I know, I know I, I, I've got New Testaments at the house that's filled with names of people that I witnessed to that told me they trusted Christ. I can't guarantee you every one of them in there is for real. But I can tell you this, every one of them told me they were. Amen? They may have lied to me, but I can guarantee you there's going to be some of them there that I'm going to be able to shout and rejoice with. Will there be any there for you? <clears throat> to be blameless in holiness. God's not going to bring up our sin. Again, He can't bring up our sin. No. I, I, listen, it's all going to be complete when we get home. It's all going to be complete. It'll be totally due to God's marvelous grace. Not anything we've done. It'll be all because of the grace through the, through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And because of that, we're going to stand blameless in Christ. Why? Because every sin has been washed away. Every sin. Every unholy thing that's ever been in our life is once and forever removed, never to return. Amen. I look forward to heaven. I don't know about you. But I, you know, my only thought is there's people listening in to this this morning who may not know they're going. There's people listening in who, who, who will slip out of eternity lost without Jesus if they don't know how to go. And so I can't close this message without simply saying this. If a person has never come to the point in their life where they've dealt with their sin, then there's no way you're going to heaven. But the Bible tells us for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And it also tells us that the gift of God, it tells us that, that we, we're all sinners, but it also tells us the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that, and that the great thing about a gift is you don't work for a gift. You just accept the gift. You receive the gift. And by faith, if someone would reach out this morning, not by, not by saying the right word, not by feeling a certain amount of sorrow or grief, but just because they realize they are lost, that they do not have the way into heaven. They don't know how to get to heaven. That Jesus has paid the way. He's done everything necessary. That he died, the Bible tells us that according to the scriptures he died. That he was buried according to the scriptures. And he rose again according to the scriptures. And by believing upon his death, burial, and resurrection, we can have that eternal life. That's all God asks, is that we believe upon what his son has done for us. And if someone could do that this morning, if someone would not, not say in perfect words, but just come to him honestly and say, Lord, I, I know I'm a sinner and I need to be forgiven. And I believe Jesus paid the price for me to be forgiven and I trust him now. A person can be born again like that and have everlasting life for all eternity. That's my prayer this morning. If somebody listening into this message is not saved, if they just come this morning, not necessarily come here, but right where they're at, if they just bow and, and ask Christ to, to be their Savior, to forgive their sins, they can have everlasting life. And my friends, this morning, if you're here this morning, if you've never trusted Christ, I urge you to believe on Him this morning and have everlasting life. Don't miss heaven for anything. Don't go to hell for anybody. Amen. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And church, I'm going to urge you this morning, if your love for, for others is not what it used to be and not what it ought to be, I urge you to come in repentance of your backslidden condition and ask God to restore and stir up the flames in your heart again that you might have that love that God, that God talks about in His Word. God help us if we've slowed down or backed up or, or, or gotten tired. Let's get refired this morning. Let's get fired up again. As the Bible says, Paul says, stir up the gift of God. Amen. Let's do that this morning. Let's, bow, let's stand together and bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, I love you and I thank you, Lord, for, for the message this morning. Father God, I pray, Lord, as we, as we come to this invitation, Lord God, I pray that you speak to the hearts of your people. Lord God, I pray that you, the Holy Spirit of God, that you, that you shine the light of, of truth down in our, our souls and, and show us, Lord, whether, where we're at in our walk with you. Lord, whether we're, we've gotten stagnant or whether we're following where, we're, where we ought to be. Lord God, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you, that you direct us to a decision for Christ and we decide that we're not going to live for ourselves anymore, that we're going to live for Jesus and experience that love and share that love with others. Lord, as we're, as we're commanded to do, and Lord, we're designed to do. Father, I pray, Lord, you'd help us to see these things. Holy Spirit, draw us to decision. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
161. Let's sing this morning. <clears throat> We've got to cease from our own way and we've got to turn it over to Christ and let Him have the reins. But if we'll do that, we'll see success in this Christian life. 